In this lecture, we're going to discuss primary amenorrhea. Let's review the normal menstrual cycle. Menstruation is dependent on ovulation, estrogen, and progesterone. The average age of menarche is around 12.7 years. And two-thirds of girls experience menarche in the genital tanner stage of tanner stage 4. Not 5, but 4. So, the definition of primary amenorrhea is when a girl has not developed menarche by the age of 14 in the absence of pubertal development, or she hasn't developed menarche by the age of 16 regardless of whether there's pubertal development. So, what causes primary amenorrhea? There can be genetic, endocrine, nutritional, or anatomical defects that result in a primary amenorrhea when she just isn't developing her period. The etiology of primary amenorrhea is basically rooted in the fact that the ovaries are not producing sufficient estrogen to proliferate uterine lining or induce ovulation. This can be because of two major causes. Either patients have a hypogonadotropic hypogonadism which is an inadequate release of gonadotropins, LH and FSH, from the pituitary, resulting in a lack of ovarian response, or the patients have hypergonadotropic hypogonadism. In this case, they have lots of FSH and LH coming down, but there's an inadequate ovarian response to these gonadotropins. Alternatively, there can be a problem with the anatomic aspects of this patient. So, for example, they may have an absent uterus or a genital outlet obstruction, such as an imperfect hymen. So, when we see a patient with primary amenorrhea, it's important to ask questions about the entirety of their history and do a good physical exam. We need to ask about and investigate other signs of pubertal progression. Does the patient have breast development? What tanner stage is the child? We need to ask about the age of menarche in the mother and the sisters, as a delay may run in the family. We need to ask about menstrual, gynecologic, and pubertal problems that run in the family, and we should always ask about sexual activity. Additionally, we should ask if the patient has abdominal pain or cramping. This is how, for example, an imperfect hymen would present. It's important and critical to ask about diet and exercise habits. One of the most common causes of primenorrhea is an excessive exercise routine or just a very competitive exercise routine or excessive dieting or just a very thin girl. These are all reasons why girls may have a delay in the onset of their menses. Also, we need to ask questions that will drill down on underlying hormonal problems. For example, if the patient is very short, she might have Turner syndrome, which may be part of the problem. So, during our physical exam, it's important to assess the Tanner stage. It's important to measure growth parameters, and specifically, a low BMI may delay onset of menses. This is in athletic kids or in kids who are dieting. Additionally, short stature may indicate a genetic or endocrine disorder, which is part of the problem. Next, we need to assess for an endocrinopathy or a genetic disease. Through the genital exam, we need to check the hymenal opening, checking for an obstruction by a thin membrane or bulging menses underneath. We need to check for an enlarged clitoris, which may be a result of excess androgens. We should look at the tanner stage of the patient, and we should do a general vaginal exam. So, the differential diagnosis for primenorrhea is important. In a patient with absent breast development, there's probably inadequate estrogen production. In a patient with an absence of a uterus, you might suspect an abnormal Mullerian development or a XY karyotype for a phenotypic female. In a patient with a presence of a uterus and breasts, you might think about obstruction of menstrual flow or an HPO axis difficulty. So, what lab tests will we get in these patients? Certainly, a pregnancy test is always indicated. It's easy to do, it's cheap, it's unlikely to be a cause, but you would hate to miss that. Additionally, we'll generally check hormone levels. We'll check androgens, 
thyroid function, and prolactin. This is a way of getting at both the HPO axis, the thyroid gland, and the pituitary. In some cases where we suspect there might be a problem in terms of the development of the Mullerian system, we will definitely get a karyotype. For example, if the patient has an abnormal uterus, or if there's no signs of puberty by the age of 14. A pelvic ultrasound may be useful to identify and evaluate the anatomy of the patient's genital urinary system. If we suspect the problem is a central problem, for example, if there's a low LH and FSH, we might want to do an MRI of the head or the pituitary, especially if there's an elevated prolactin level as well, or if there are abnormal neurologic findings. So how do we treat primary amenorrhea? If a patient has either hyper or hypogonadotropic hypogonadism, we usually will start the patient on oral contraceptive pills. This is going to allow us to regulate this cycle and standardize their hormonal fluctuation. Additionally, if they have imperfect hymen, this requires a surgical correction. In fact, it's pretty emergent. We may choose to consult an endocrinologist if we need help guiding the patient through puberty and development. Diet and exercise regimens may be important if we suspect hypothalamic dysregulation due to malnutrition or excessive exercise. So in patients with eating disorders who are powerfully interested in athletics, sometimes changing their dietary and exercise regimen may be sufficient to bring on their menses. Additionally, ultrasound may be needed to determine if there are undescended testes if a patient has androgen insensitivity syndrome. Remember, undescended testes in a phenotypic female still have oncologic potential. So secondary amenorrhea is the absence of menses for more than six months in a patient who was previously menstruating. Generally, these patients have a normal puberty development. There's not a primary problem with how they're developing in their puberty. Remember, adolescents may have anovulatory cycles, and so they can be fairly irregular, especially early on but a period of six months is too long. This is generally a disruption in the HPO axis. It can be a result of inadequate GnRH release, inadequate LH and FSH release, or insufficient estrogen to stimulate the LH surge and ovulation. So what is important to ask in a patient who has secondary amenorrhea? It's important to ask about sexual activity this patient may be pregnant. It's important to ask them about eating behaviors. New onset of an eating disorder could certainly result in a secondary amenorrhea. Ask also about competitive athletic events and excessive exercise. Ask about a history of chemotherapy or pelvic irradiation. Certainly you want to ask about a family history of menstrual or gynecologic problems that are going on. And sometimes drugs can cause this, so ask in particular about psychotropic medica medications or illegal drugs. And ask about underlying hormonal problems that might be going on. So what do we look for in a physical exam in a girl with secondary amenorrhea? It's important to assess their Tanner stage and know where they are in their pubertal development. Assess the height, weight, and BMI, especially in a very thin-appearing girl. You need to do a genital exam. It's important to check for clitoromegaly, which may result from excessive androgens like testosterone, and it's also important to do a bimanual exam to assess the shape and tenderness of the uterus and ovaries. Check a skin exam for specifically hirsutism, acne, striae, or acanthosis nigricans. And think about an endocrinopathy. Check the thyroid. Look for other physical exams findings of endocrinopathies. So what are the organic causes of secondary amenorrhea? One is a mass, like a prolactinoma, in the pituitary gland. Patients may have hyperthyroidism, or they may have hypothyroidism. One syndrome that can definitely present with secondary amenorrhea is the polycystic ovarian syndrome. We'll talk about that more completely in a bit. 
Additionally, patients may have late onset congenital adrenal hyperplasia. That would be very rare, but you might suspect it in a patient with a large clitoris. Additionally, rarely, patients may have virilizing tumors. So what testing do we get in these patients? Well, if there's no obvious physical exam findings and we're worried, we should certainly check a pregnancy test. For patients with concern for thyroid disease, you would get a TSH and a free T4. Likewise, if a patient had concerns for a prolactinoma, we could check a prolactin level. In patients where they are highly virilized or have a large clitoris, a free and total testosterone is probably indicated. And if we're worried about that HPO access, we can get an LH and FSH. And remember, insulin levels may be elevated in patients with polycystic ovarian syndrome. If we're going to image, pelvic ultrasound is the most useful way to start. It's a very useful way to evaluate patient's reproductive anatomy. However, if we suspect a central process, we would obtain an MRI of the head with a cut down images of the pituitary, especially in patients with elevated prolactin. While we don't think of this as a typical imaging modality to assess the genitourinal tract, Oftentimes, patients will get a DEXA scan to see if they're having any compromising of their bone mineral density, as some of these conditions may result in those problems. One way to assess secondary amenorrhea is to do a progesterone challenge test. In this test, we administer oral progesterone for five to 10 days, and then we look for signs of withdrawal bleeding after that medicine is stopped. So, a positive test is any bleeding that happens more than light spotting that occurs within two weeks after they stop the progesterone. And it will usually occur between two and seven days after that progesterone is finished. So how do we interpret this test? If there is bleeding, that means that the endometrium has been primed by estrogen. This patient likely has anovulation. So we should consider the possibility of polycystic ovarian syndrome. If the patient has no bleeding, we now have to think about evaluating for an HPO axis insufficiency. And we should also consider outflow tract obstruction through some structural problem. So when we treat patients, we want to treat the underlying etiology of the secondary amenorrhea. We should think about nutrition counseling in patients who are having eating disorders. We should think about endocrinology referral or gynecologic referral, depending on whether we suspect there is a primary endocrinologic problem, like a problem in the HPO axis, versus a gynecologic problem, like an obstruction of outflow tract. Consider psychologic interview for eating disorders and psychosocial stressors. This is a common cause of secondary amenorrhea in children, especially children who are more affluent living in the suburbs where we see a lot of eating disorders. Consider OCP therapy as a way of regulating the cycle and getting things back on track again in certain applicable individuals. How can we treat PCOS? Well, with polycystic ovarian syndrome, which is associated with patients who are a little bit overweight and have multiple cysts going through their ovaries, and they sometimes have hirsutism as well, we generally will treat these patients with oral contraceptive pills. This restores a regular menstrual cycle, and it also decreases the testosterone that they have in their system. We will use OCPs because they can protect against endometrial hyperplasia. When we're choosing our oral contraceptive pill, practitioners may choose a drug that has drospirinone as the progestin component because of its antiandrogenergic properties. In addition to oral contraceptive pills, we will often provide insulin sensitizing agents such as metformin. Metformin is also used in type 2 diabetes or the metabolic syndrome. This drug will decrease circulating androgens. It may improve reproductive function, and it can improve metabolic complications, thus maybe help with a bit with weight loss. So that's my review of secondary amenorrhea.
in adolescent girls. Thanks for your time. <laughs>